I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 58. In today's podcast, we're talking about success. And this is part of Dog Agility Blogger Action Day. We should also mention that we're recording this podcast in video format as well as audio only. So anybody who would like to check us out on YouTube can view the podcast that way as well. So the topic for Dog Agility Blogger Action Day is success, and the aspect of success that we wanted to talk about today was the fact that success is not linear, especially when it comes to dog training. So what I mean by that is success does not happen little by little at a steady rate. There are jumps forward in training. It happens a lot with latent learning in dogs where, Mm -hmm. you know, they kind of go away after a session. It's like they think about it in their crates and they come out more brilliant than they were before. But there are also times when training stalls out um, and even times when there's regressions in training. I think when people think about success in dog agility, especially in training, they link it to uh, results, right? It becomes very goal oriented. You set a goal for yourself. And if you achieve that goal, you say, hey, I'm a success. And if I don't meet that goal, you know, if I fail to qualify for the national championship, or if I go to the national championship, but I do poorly, then I'm not successful. And that's why we're taking this uh, different uh, slant on the topic of success. And I completely agree with Sarah. There's a very powerful idea in dog training, which helps many people through very tough training sessions. And it's the idea that your dog is going to get better. As you train more, as your dog becomes older, as you become more skilled as a trainer, you're just going to see this very linear progression. Uh, And that's just not the case. And that's something I think that people don't really think about on a very conscious level. It's something that might sound obvious, when we talk with you about it now, but it's not something that I think that trainers keep in the, in the forefront of their minds when they're having these sessions. That's right. And so I think people can become discouraged easily rather than recognizing that this is just a normal part of training. And I think it's just human nature that people are very good at accepting the jumps forward. Uh, It almost feels like you got to skip some steps, that you're ahead of the game. You got to where you were planning to go a little bit earlier than you thought. Um, But then when things stall out or you have regressions, you feel like you've done something wrong, Mm -hmm. um, that there uh, is a mistake there that you're making as the trainer or that your dog's making. So... uh, We as trainers need to recognize that these regressions are natural. And there are a couple of examples in agility that come to mind right away. One of those is two by two training. So um, Susan Garrett's two by two method, she actually builds into the method points in time where you're supposed to take your two by twos and move them someplace else in the yard. Well, and for people in our audience who don't know, the two by two method is for teaching weave pole training, which is uh, a notorious, notoriously difficult obstacle to perform in agility. That's right. And so a lot of times um, you'll have been working very, very difficult weave pull entries, working through the method. Your dog is brilliant. Mm -hmm. They are never making a mistake that you can't get them to make an incorrect entry. And then you move the poles to a different part of the yard and the whole thing falls apart. It's like they've never seen them before. Right. So now I feel like maybe Sarah's talking about me personally. I've got a young (laughs) dog that I'm trying to debut in about two weeks time. Uh, in novice and I'm very excited about this dog she's very talented and the last part of getting her ready for this competition is to teach her to do six weave pulls and so we are using the two by two method and I thought we had some very good sessions it was going very very well Uh, we did move the poles to a different part of the yard and the behavior did fall apart and um, I was pretty frustrated Um, I may or may not have thrown a clicker at a gate (laughs) after I ended one session in frustration. Uh, It can be very tough. Sometimes you feel like the dog has very good understanding of the behavior that you want. And when you change something about the environment, uh, you put the weave poles a little bit closer together or you have more distractions around uh, and the behavior falls apart, it's a very frustrating thing because you think you're so close to having it You see yourself progressing at a very solid, steady rate, and um, you're excited to brag to your friends about it, post videos of it on Facebook, right, so everyone can tell you how great you are and how great your dog looks, and then suddenly it falls apart, and you say, 
hey, I'm just 10 days away from this competition and my dog still can't weave. So, you know, that can be very, very frustrating. And um, it, it was for me, you know, so. Right. And another um, uh, example that came to my mind was running contact training. So we have a friend, Susan, who was teaching her dog running contacts. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the method she was using, Sylvia Turkman's method, she was basically running her dog across the dog walk at a certain height. The, the dog walk was set at a certain height. Mm -hmm. And it was beautiful, like just hitting the yellow contact area every single time. Just absolutely gorgeous. She raises it like one inch and the whole thing falls apart. <laughs> Right. The dog starts <laughs> leaping off, right. completely missing the yellow. And again, you're in a situation where things have been progressing very nicely and now you have this big regression. And, and it's very nerve wracking for mm. the handler. And so, you know, she was working with Sylvia Turkman on one of her online classes and emailed her and Sylvia Turkman says, oh, yes, you know, that's just what happens. Uh, just work through it. And uh, when she's solid again, then you can raise it again. And she did and made it through the entire um, you know, series and ended up with a dog with beautiful running contacts. So. I think the key there is managing expectations. And for Susan, who was taking this dog through this method for the very first time, um, when she runs into this problem, she doesn't really know how big of a deal it is. It seems like a catastrophic, very, very big deal. The behavior is just falling apart, even though you have dozens or hundreds of repetitions behind you. Um, but Sylvia says, hey, you know, it's not a big deal. It happens to everybody. That's right. Just take your time. And once someone who's been there gives you that kind of expectation, you can take a deep breath, relax, and work through it. That's right. And I think that, um, it, you know, we talk a lot about different dogs and different dog personalities and how you work through things with different dogs. I think what we often ignore a little bit is the personality of the trainers and the expectations that the trainers have and mm -hmm. the experience that the trainer has, um, you know, just in life and the effect that that can have on a person. So mm -hmm. for myself, I work in software. And so I'm very used to, I mean, a lot of my job involves me just coding, right? Like <laughs> writing code to solve a problem. I know that I want to do something and I just, I have the knowledge of a coding language to do it. But actually, the vast majority of my time is spent figuring out um, how I'm going to code that, the, the creative process, what the solution is going to be. And so in my line of work, I'll spend, you know, a week, two weeks kind of staring at a blank screen, uh, trying to figure out the answer to a problem, maybe even trying a few things. They don't work. Trying something else. They don't work. Um thinking through the problem and then that spark of insight comes and I spend, you know, one or two days just coding the whole thing up. So I'm very used to, in my life, having these spurts of progress. And so when I see that in my dogs, it doesn't bother me so much, you know? So I feel like for me personally, um, you know, that's just uh, how I feel about the way progress is made. It's something that I'm used to. Well, that's a very interesting perspective. And I think all I heard was, blah, 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 I get paid for staring at a blank screen for a couple of weeks without doing any work, and then I do something, and then I get paid. So, you know, that's all I heard. Um, from my point of view, though, it's interesting that you mentioned your profession. So uh, my profession, I guess my background is I, I, I am a doctor, I'm a physician, and I work in wound care. And one of the thing that, things that's very important for us is to set the expectation with patients and with families because as, as a, a doctor when someone comes to you with a problem you basically tell them hey we're going to try this and I think it's going to work I think it's going to fix it um, and sometimes a doctor can be very focused on this is going to work and not so focused on these are all the possible things that can happen or go wrong. We describe healing and wound care also as a nonlinear process, but if you're not careful, you can give a patient or a family the impression that, hey, this is going to be better starting today because I'm here talking to you. Tomorrow it's going to be twice as good, and in a week this wound is going to be gone, uh, your loved one is going to be healed up and everything's going to be okay. And sometimes that doesn't happen. You know, you can develop infections, complications, things like that. Sometimes the wounds get bigger, then they get smaller. Uh, they need antibiotics. Sometimes they don't. So for all of those reasons, uh, wound healing is not linear. And I think you see the very same parallel here 
in dog training. And that's why I think it's very important as instructors and trainers, when you're talking with students, that you really set those expectations as well. As long as you're overall progressing, you're headed in the right direction, I think you are a success. You're being successful there. Even though on a day-to-day, session-to-session, or even repetition-by-repetition, you, you're going to have failures and setbacks mixed into there. That's right. And so I think with training and with your job in medicine, uh, the problem comes in that sometimes a stall or regression does mean you're on the wrong path. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it means you do need to change the medication for your patient. Sometimes it means you do need to change the method that you're training your weave poles or your running contacts. So how do you deal with that situation? How do you, the trainer, decide when a regression is a natural part of learning and when you need to make a change, right? And so I think that there are three main ways that you can do that. I think that you can draw on your own experience, You can draw on the experience of others, usually an instructor, somebody Mm -hmm. like Sylvia Turkman, if you're teaching running contacts. And I think the third way is a healthy dose of irrational confidence. (laughs) So we've talked about irrational confidence on the podcast before, basically uh, just kind of having that confidence in yourself and your dog kind of in spite of, of what's going on. So I'll talk about each of those things. The first one is your own experience. So Uh, Myself, uh, I've taught quite a few dogs to weave using two by two. Mm -hmm. Um, I've taught um, or I've coached students through teaching their dogs to weave with two by two. So I'm very comfortable with that whole process. Mm -hmm. And when things do fall apart, when there are bad sessions, um, it's very easy for me because I've seen other dogs have bad sessions and then get it back and then proceed through the program, it's very easy for me to to deal with that and to understand that. So um, I draw on my own experience there. I think as we become um, even more experienced as dog trainers, just from the point of view of learning theory and even handling theory, Mm -hmm. uh, the more experience you have there, you can take something you've never taught before, but if you understand the hows and whys of how somebody else is teaching it, um, you can make a pretty good guess as to whether that's going to work for you and your dog. And if the theory is sound, that can help you, you know, work through those regressions as well. So kind of drawing on your experience more generally as a dog trainer or drawing on your experience on a very specific skill. I think your experience level definitely matters. And I think when you think about our audience here for this podcast, you, you're, you're going to see a lot of variety in, in the amount of experience a, a person has, not only in agility, but in dog training. You're going to have some people, I know that when we first started in agility, you, you want someone sometimes to take you by the hand and tell you to put your left foot here, put your right foot here, put your hand up this high, use this command and do it at this moment. You know, you kind of really need that hand holding. Uh, but for the more experienced competitor, you can kind of get more to the principles behind right. that. And what are we looking for here? Well, we're looking for, say, a tight turn. And these are all the different ways that you may encourage your dog to turn more tightly, either through training, uh, your motion, um, Uh, your use of your arms, your eye contact, different things like that. So depending on your own experience, you know, you're going to have a different approach to it. That's right. So then the second way I think we get through these um, spots is by using the experience of others. So uh, to me, the running contact example is just perfect. Like Mm -hmm. when, when things fell apart with our friend Susan, when she was teaching running contacts, um, you know, she if she was on her own, you know, she might not have made it through. But mm. she posted her video to Sylvia, and Sylvia's response was was so much like, oh, yeah, that's just the way it goes. Yeah, that, that happens. No biggie, you know. And, it happens. Right. It's, it's like when you're potty training your three-year-old, right? Right, <laughs> right. And they, uh, you know, poop in the middle of the living room. Right. It's a no big deal. It happens. It happens. It happens. It happens. That's right. And so, you know, having that person who's been through it, themselves, who's coached, you know, hundreds of other students through it, tell you, oh, that's to be expected. Uh, It'll come back and then we'll move on is very comforting. And it helps you get through areas where you don't have your own experience to draw from. Mm -hmm. 
So, and I think uh, that irrational confidence, I think this happens so often with people who are brand new to the sport with their first dog, and especially with a dog that does well naturally, right? So these people come out and they, they work through a class. They just kind of systematically do everything their instructor says. They get out at a novice, uh, mm -hmm. probably not very well prepared, but enough to get some cues, right? Okay. And they, they slowly put it together. And, and many times people have great success with their first dogs. And I think uh, that comes back to that irrational confidence. They just, they don't even really know any better to know that they should be concerned about um, conflicting signals in their system, mm. or, you know, or anything like that. And so, you know, they just go out and they have this, this innocence that allows them to get through it, right? So this is an ignorance is bliss approach yes, to absolutely. dog agility. And I think it happens a lot of times with people's first dogs. And I think that's why sometimes the second dogs are so difficult because maybe you had a high degree of sex set a, a high degree of success with mm -hmm. your first dog and uh, but you had a problem with contacts right oh, so okay. you know you were beating people left and right you know uh, in in the masters level you went to nationals you had some amazing runs top 10 you know but you don't have a consistent contact right mm -hmm. so now you get your second dog and by golly you do not want to mess up that contact right and you're paralyzed and you don't know what to do and now you're stuck in this really awkward situation where you don't really have enough of your own experience to draw on. It's mm -hmm. only your second dog, right? Sure. But you've lost that irrational confidence of the complete newbie to agility. Yes. Right? And so I think for a lot of people, that could be a very difficult stage to get through. You pretty much, you know, you need to have, uh, you know, some really good instructors that you're working with so that you can draw from their experience as well. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting perspective and one that I hadn't really thought of yeah. Right. And I think that probably parallels our own experience in some ways, having had uh, very good first dogs in both of our careers. Yeah, you'd be surprised. You know, with that first dog, you just don't know what's possible. And there's no one, to, uh, at, at least you yourself, you're not telling yourself, hey, you can't do that because you don't know that you can do that. Right. Or you can't do that. So you go out and you try it. And then a lot of times you're able to do it. That's right. So kind of the point of the entire podcast is, like you said, this is something that um, makes sense when you talk about it, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's always in people's minds. And so when you have those lulls in your training, when you have those regressions, um, you need to be able to step back and evaluate what's going on. And you need to uh, understand that it's part of the, the, the progress, the part mm -hmm. of the, the path to success. And... Um, you need to be able to do that because of something else we've talked about recently, which is the conditioned emotional response for both yourself and your dog. It is very easy to um, get into a negative cycle where you become frustrated with your dog, your dog feeds off of that, they become even more hesitant to offer you the behavior, uh, which in turn makes you feel even worse. So to get out of these regressions, you you have to have a great attitude in your training. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think just being aware that it's normal can help you have that, that attitude. I think those are all really good points. And just when you think of the concept of success and how to apply it to your own dog agility training, I'd encourage you to separate it a little bit, I think, from your goals or your long-term goals or really your results and just understand that success is nonlinear, right? Overall, you want it to steadily increase, but it's there's going to be ups, downs, peaks, valleys, plateaus, um, you know, minor setbacks. You just want to trend overall in the right direction. And um, we have a great quote that I'd like to share with you, and that's, success is the sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. So when you're thinking about your dog training, um, I don't think, there's too much value in saying, well, you know, we're going to go to our weekly class, we're going to train at home, and then we're going to go to this competition. And if we do great at this competition, if we make the world team, if we do this, that, or the other, then we are successful. And if we don't, then we are not successful. Um, but rather, because you've been having that success on a daily basis, uh, on a per session basis, and even on a per repetition basis, you're having that success every single day. And you can think of um, whatever your performance is going to be as the culmination of all of those successes, but not in and of itself successful or unsuccessful, if that makes sense to you. 
That's right. And that's it for this week's podcast. Uh, again, this is part of Dog Agility Blogger Action Day. So uh, dog agility bloggers all over the world are all going to be talking about success. Make and sure you check out some of the other articles that other right. people will be putting up on the same topic. Yep. And we'll have a link to that uh, in the show notes for this episode so that you can easily find all of those articles. Mm-hmm. And that's it for this week's podcast. Happy training. <laughs>